Hello, my name is Jim Waltham, Museum Director. Welcome to the National Museum of Nuclear Science and History. Hello, I'm Jennifer Hayden, Deputy Director at the National Museum of Nuclear Science and History, and I am here to introduce you to the Critical Assembly Exhibition at the Nuclear Museum. Now, this exhibit is very relevant to New Mexico. Much like the museum, we are here for a reason. The Atomic Age truly began in New Mexico with the Manhattan Project in Los Alamos. Now, Critical Assembly, which was designed by the American sculptor Jim Sanborn, this was his artist's tableau of what he believes the laboratories looked like during the Manhattan Project in Los Alamos. So behind me, we have all types of items that were either sculpted by Mr. Sanborn or he was able to have them donated or given to him that are actual objects and artifacts that were used during the Manhattan Project in Los Alamos. So this is just one of the amazing areas to visit that tells you about the beginning of World War II, uh, really about the beginning of the Atomic Age. Another reason that the Atomic Age is so very relevant to New Mexico to where the National Museum of Nuclear Science and History is housed here in Albuquerque, New Mexico, would be the Trinity Test. So that was the world's very first testing of the atomic bomb, July 16, 1945, when they hoisted the world's very first atomic bomb up a 100-foot steel tower to see what would happen when it was detonated. So on this 100-foot steel tower, there is a shed at the very top that the bomb went into, and then all of the scientists, the engineers, military people, everyone went about 10 miles away to see exactly what would happen, not knowing what would happen to the world with the world's very first atomic bomb. So in our Trinity area, our exhibit at the museum, we have artifacts and objects such as the bomb casings of Fat Man and Little Boy which were the bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki ending World War II. We have limousines, Oppenheimer's limo, that is said to have driven Oppenheimer back and forth between Los Alamos and the Trinity site. We have the American flag that was flown at Trinity site, and we even have an object that is actual Trinitite, the green glass that was formed when the heat of the atomic bomb blast went off and it hit the white sands of New Mexico. Very, very unique object, very, very unique materials that we actually have on display here at the museum. The Trinity test was a very difficult time. Here we have the gadget. This is a device that was used to test the Trinity weapon. Now, they used it and called it the gadget because they did not want to use the word bomb. There were spies at that time trying to steal the secrets of the United States and use them to their advantage during the war. The gadget, and this is one of the only ones there is, was a device that included high explosive lenses that would implode and crush a piece of plutonium down to criticality level causing an explosion. This is what was tested at Trinity. The Cold War was an intense time for our world. Although it didn't result in an atomic exchange, we came close several times. And we built an immense arsenal. Many countries did, principally the United States and the Soviet Union. We went from having two bombs to thousands during the 1960s and 70s. This museum has the largest collection of those materials that are unclassified that people can understand and look at. And here in this gallery, many of them are found. During this time, you heard about things like duck and cover, civil defense, 
in the uh, sense that the United States would be able to do first strike. Other things that were discussed were MAD. That's not being angry. MAD stood for Mutually Assured Destruction. This was a doctrine of our government that would essentially annihilate many people who were citizens. Millions could die if there had been an exchange. There was a thing that was created called the Triad. The Triad was a defense attempt using submarines and hardened silo-mounted missiles and bomber-dropped atomic weapons in an attempt to make it impossible for the Soviet Union to survive a second strike. And we did not have a hot war or World War III during the Cold War. The Cold War ended in the 1990s, the early 90s, as the Soviet Union and communism in that area collapsed. Though today, the world is still not a safe place. Atomic weapons are still out there. Atomic pop culture extends into the design as well. Homes and many things in offices were designed with an atomic flair in the 1950s and 1960s. And it went on after that. We have several automobiles here that are part of our atomic cultural collection. Here before us, we have the Go Nuclear Mazda. This was a racing car that was operated by a special group of people called the Newman Wax Racing Team. The Newman Walks Racing Team was headed by Paul Newman, the actor, as well as Eddie Walks, the very, very uh, well-known racing car driver. These two men were very supportive of nuclear power generation, and so their automobiles promoted nuclear power. Once again, part of nuclear culture. The National Museum of Nuclear Science and History tells the story of the atomic age, from early developments such as the Manhattan Project and the Cold War, to today's peaceful uses of nuclear technology such as nuclear medicine and nuclear energy. At our museum we have a very special exhibition that talks about nuclear energy. Within this exhibition area we talk about the carbon-free power that this provides. We talk about partnerships with different nuclear power plants, such as Palo Verde Generating Station in Arizona. This is an engaging, interactive area where kids and adults and families of all ages and background can come in and learn, think, imagine, and draw their own conclusions regarding all types of atomic and nuclear energy and science. Heisenberg was one of Germany's most important scientists. During World War II, his work included trying to build all of the things necessary for the very first atomic bomb. Many think that the United States was the preeminent program to do that, but in fact, the Germans. The Germans had the brains, they had the scientists, they had heavy water, they had the largest stockpile of uranium, and they had Heisenberg. And so they could have been far, far ahead of the United States. This exhibit, Heisenberg's Race for the Bomb, has a very unique artifact in it because as the Germans went through with their program to build an atomic bomb, they built pieces and many were available at the very end of the war and the United States military confiscated them. If we go over here, we can see a piece of that. Here is a piece of uranium that was from Hitler's very last reactor. There were a number of these in that reactor, 664 of them arranged in a big vat of heavy water. As the war ended in Europe, the United States had a group of scientists who went to try and learn what the Germans knew and to grab all that knowledge and all that material so that it wouldn't fall into the hands of the Soviet Union. Even though the Soviet Union was one of our allies, we didn't want them to know what the Germans had discovered. So this object here 
is our piece of uranium from that. There are only a few of these known to exist today of that original 664. It is pure uranium. It doesn't have any of the materials that would be in uranium if it had been in a reactor or if it had been enriched. It hasn't been. So here in the museum, inside this case, it's safe for us to be around it. I hope you'll take time to come and see it here at the museum. This is truly a unique artifact because the mere existence of this is what caused the United States to take on the immense project called the Manhattan Project, where they built an atomic weapon and used it to end World War II. in our outdoor exhibit area, Heritage Park. So this is a nine acre outdoor exhibit area that has airplanes, we have missiles, we have a nuclear submarine sail behind me, all kinds of artifacts and objects that are too big to go inside the museum. So with Heritage Park, we have airplanes that I'm about to throw a lot of numbers and letters at you all at once. We have our B-29 Super Fortress, which is the same type of airplane as the Enola Gay that ended World War II. We have the B-52 Strata Fortress that has a surface area of over three quarters of an acre. It is so huge. Also, it is the last airplane in American history to drop a nuclear bomb for testing purposes but it is Albuquerque's airplane that went straight from Boeing to Albuquerque and it's been here ever since now at our museum. We have a B-47 Stratojet, we have an F-16 Fighting Falcon, there's so many airplanes here. Our submarine cell is the USS James K. Polk nuclear submarine cell and with this people ask me all the time do you have a submarine underneath the ground? Unfortunately we do not, that would be very very cool if we did but we also have a Trinity Tower. So the Trinity Tower is the 100 foot steel tower. It's a replica of the one that was used in 1945 to hold the world's very first atomic bomb, the gadget that was tested in White Sands, New Mexico. I hope you've enjoyed seeing some of the science exhibits here at the National Museum of Nuclear Science and History. There are a fascinating array of things to learn and explore if you're able to come for a visit and we hope you've enjoyed this video walkthrough. Again, my name is Jim Walther. I'm the museum director, and you're at the National Museum of Nuclear Science and History. <laughs>